There we go. Welcome everyone, my name is Jesse Althorn Fix and you are here for a special Midnight's for Maniacs presentation uh, of a double feature tribute to Twin Peaks, the greatest TV show of all time. Now some of you, uh, you're not here because it's a tribute to Twin Peaks, you're here because Peyton Place um, is celebrating its 60th anniversary and from what I know has never screened in San Francisco since 1957. That's terrible. That's a terrible idea because it uh, is truly a remarkable movie um, that slips through the cracks of film history and these types of movies are exactly what Midnight's for Maniacs has been celebrating uh, for 15 years now. Um, underrated and overlooked films. Uh, the majority of these movies have been from the 70s to the present because that is the time that I grew up in. But every decade uh, has these types of movies. There are movies that are coming out this year that will slip through the cracks. Um, they'll be maybe relevant at a certain moment and then people will forget. And Peyton Place is one of them. Um, as I said, 60 years ago this came out and was nominated for quite a lot of Academy Awards. Um, and what I'm most excited about for us to get to do, this is a restoration uh, digital print. And it is a long soap opera. In fact, Peyton Place is what created the concept of a soap opera. It was turned into TV shows. Uh, which ultimately then inspired all of the soap operas that we have today. Um, you know, like Game of Thrones. The soap opera. Now, often they are dismissed and uh, thrown away because they maybe are shot with five cameras with one take and uh, they have to constantly get made and so people don't take them so seriously. There are some filmmakers that do. Pedro Almod Almodovar, David Lynch, they actually emphasize the melodrama because they grew up with these types of movies. Films like Rebel Without a Cause, films like All That Heaven Allows. Uh, these movies were often ridiculed at the time for being too heightened. The drama being mellow, uh, somehow people in the critical world think that that is somehow low-hanging fruit, that it's too easy to achieve. And it's only decades later that we're able to look back on a filmmaker uh, who made perhaps a film like Imitation of Life, directed by Douglas Sirk, Nicholas Ray's entire career, movies like Bigger Than Life, um, Rebel Without a Cause, and they're able to reevaluate them as maybe 
truly time capsules from a certain period and ripping away the facade. Now that's what David Lynch has done with his films uh, throughout his career and those of you who are crazy enough to stick around tonight for the double bill uh, will get to see his version of Peyton Place before Twin Peaks. It's called Blue Velvet. Who's sticking around for Blue Velvet? All right. Now, um, I want to emphasize, in fact, that this is so rare of a screening that uh, one of the lead actors in the film, uh, Diane Varsi, who plays Allison, her daughter is here tonight to see it on the big screen for the very first time. Can we please give Willow a hand? Where are we, Willow? Now, I teach film history at the Academy of Art University. I taught it for 11 years. And um, something that I found is that some of us, we, we think that we're supposed to be uh, highbrow art, that that makes us smart. And so we have a very sarcastic attitude towards films that perhaps people think are so bad that they're good. David Lynch is one of those filmmakers that confuses people. And I would like you to somehow apply that same sort of respect to a film like Peyton Place because I have a feeling people haven't taken this movie seriously. They've only tossed it off as um, a soap opera. Now in the 1940s and 50s we had this genre called film noir. And these movies were ridiculed at the time. No one called them that. They just called them melodramas. They were with anti-heroes and femme fatales. They took place in big cities, dirty streets, and the morals were out the window. What I'd like to propose tonight is that a new genre is born with a movie like Peyton Place or All That Heaven Allows and it would be called a film blanc. <laughs> because these films, they take place during the day. They're in the suburban neighborhoods as opposed in the big cities. But they are doing the exact same thing that Film Noir was doing of the time. We had a production code that censored all of our films from 1934 to 1968 here in America. You couldn't just say what you wanted to. And it's what makes maybe the golden era of Hollywood so interesting to read between the lines, pick up on the subtext, and maybe figure out what they're hinting at, what they're alluding to, as opposed to what we get nowadays where David Lynch can actually uh, flesh it out completely. And the movie is two hours and 45 minutes, so I would love to get started, but I want to do something that back in the day when this movie was released, they would do in movie theaters. I find it very um, poignant to do it here in the oldest movie theater in San Francisco. Can we give it up for the Roxy Theater? Is I want to give away, um, I want to raffle I want to raffle some things away to you. So you have a special ticket for tonight that has a number. If you could pull this out. Now this raffle, this is, they used to do this at movie theaters to try and lure you in to come to the theater instead of staying at home to watch this new invention called the TV set. And when Peyton Place came out, uh, we really did lose a lot of audience members. They wanted to just stay at home. So they would um, offer like dishes and cups and saucers to try and get people to come in and maybe build up an entire collection. Uh, tonight what I'd like to give you is some, some uh, outdated Twin Peaks and um, perhaps Film Blanc memorabilia. To, um, let's try number 74. Who's number? I swear, that is not real. I don't know who to get, the fix, that's my last name, is Fix, so. What I'd like to give you, I don't even know what to give you now. How about a laser disc for Laura? Can we give it up right here for Diane Barcy's daughter, Willow? I swear, that's totally insane. <laughs> All right, how about number um, 22? Number 22, come on up. Now, for getting that correct, I'd like to give you a Twin Peaks.
pilot Laserdisc from Japan. <laughs> You're welcome. I know you guys don't have Laserdisc players, so it's kind of like me giving away my old shit. <laughs> Alright, here's a big one. Um, how about we get number six... Three. Number 63. Where's number 63? Come on up. I would like to give you this poster here of David Lynch from Spoke Art Museum who donated this for our screening tonight. Here you go. And I've got tons more stuff to give away for those of you that aren't going to stay for Blue Velvet. Make sure to stick around for at least the, uh, the old-fashioned ways of communicating, uh, coming out to a movie theater, hopefully meeting your new best friends in this place. You guys, my name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix. This is Midnight's for Maniacs. Have a wonderful time with Peyton Place. Can we give it up for Diane Farsi right here playing Allison? With Willow, the daughter in the audience. Now we have a second film that is uh, going to be starting called Blue Velvet. And those of you that are going to stick around for it, please make sure we have a, a nice five or ten minute break here to go get some food, um, some drinks, and uh, hopefully you can uh, party in the Roxy Theater here tonight with a brand new best friend. Thank you for coming out, you guys. See you in a bit. All right, welcome back, you guys. Could we give it up for Peyton Place? Now, as I said, I'm a, a film history teacher, and um, I've also been programming films for 15 years. And um, a movie from the 1950s is often very difficult for modern audiences, and I'm not just talking about young people. Uh, often older people, they don't know how to adapt themselves to a different decade. Um, even just teaching movies from the 1990s, the kids who were born in 1999, they just laugh hysterically at things from the 1990s because they don't get it. They didn't grow up around it. And while perhaps people are laughing, you could be sitting right next to them sobbing. Because something I'm hoping is that by us watching Peyton Place tonight and then jumping to David Lynch's Blue Velvet, you will pick up on, in fact, what David Lynch was inspired by and then what he has created that often puts people in the exact same situation. Now, 15 years ago, I started programming at the Four Star Theater, and I moved over to the Castro Movie Palace 11 years ago. Can we give it up for this unbelievable theater? And the very first program, the very first program that I did was a David Lynch film series. And watching Blue Velvet in an audience is often extremely traumatizing. And not because of David Lynch's movie, but because of how polar opposite the audience will be. Now there are often films like this, uh, A Clockwork Orange, uh, Blue Velvet. They are transgressive. They are quite um, dark as well as humorous. And people don't know when they're supposed to laugh and when they're just terrified. And so I wanted to open this up for everyone in this room that it is going to bring up some very uncomfortable feelings. And people often respond differently. Um, what I hope is that everyone in this theater respects the film, no matter how you're responding to it. Now one thing about Midnight's for Maniacs that I have stressed for 15 years is that this is not a place for you to come and yell stupid one-liners at. You can go to other midnight programs around San Francisco to do that. In fact, you're coming here to maybe uncover what has made this film now for 30 years 
change a lot of people's lives in this theater. You have grown up with Blue Velvet. You saw it when it originally came out. Perhaps you watched it when it came out on VHS. Some of you, you grew up with it on cable. Then it came out on DVD. So some of you, you watched it immensely on DVDs. And then now, we've got a Blu-ray generation or a streaming generation. And every group finds some way to connect with what is truly a remake of Peyton Place. And Peyton Place did the exact same thing back in the 1950s. It came off as weird, trashy, and even offensive. And yet, both of these movies, as well as the TV series Twin Peaks, they almost feel like they're made today. Now we got Twin Peaks season three coming out in just 10 days. And don't worry if you've never seen Twin Peaks and it just sounds like we're obsessed with Star Trek. Because, in fact, Star Trek changed people's lives in the exact same way. But what is going to happen here is, for me, this is a 25-year-old dream. And I want to be extremely personal. It's the age of 17. All I wished for was that Twin Peaks would somehow continue. <laughs> I know, it doesn't sound like the greatest goal in life, but it really was mine because high school was absolutely horrible for me. And David Lynch and Twin Peaks changed my life and it made me obsessed with film. It gave me a sense of purpose, just like we saw Allison writing in Peyton Place. It gave you a way out. I grew up in fucking Salt Lake City, Utah. And it gave me what I have today with this film series and with all of you here. And so I genuinely want to give things to you, even though you're going to have your own personal experience here. So please let's get your, um, your homemade ticket stub out here that's got a raffle number on it. And I make these ticket stubs so that some of you, you might actually keep them because I've got all my ticket stubs since I was 15 years old. Because going to the movies is, um, is better than real life. You got your ticket stub? All right, let's get number uh, 96 up here. Number 96, where are you? Come here. Let's give it up for 96. Okay, now you get to choose a couple of, uh, from a couple of items here. This is called a CD, and it's the Twin Peaks soundtrack by Angelo Badalamenti. This is called a cassette, and this is the Twin Peaks soundtrack by Angelo Badalamenti. This is a VHS of the Twin Peaks pilot that has the extra footage. And this is called a book. <laughs> and this is the secret diary of Laura Palmer. Yeah. What would you like? <laughs> you got the book. Very good. Get out of here. Thank you. Now, a lot of us, we don't have any of those mediums. That's what she said. No CD player, no cassette player, no VHS player. And this is then a reflection of the Twin Peaks era, right? The 1980s and the 90s. So, number 111, come on up. Number 111, you're so close, right? Where are you? Or are you just going to stand there? Come on. All right, number 101. Number 101. That's what I like. Look at this. Someone's running. You aren't getting shit. Look at that walk. Fucking hipster walk. Now, what would you like? You want a CD, a cassette, or a VHS? CD, that's yours. Good job. What would you like, sir? You want a cassette or a VHS? VHS tape. Very good. Give it up here for. All right. How about number forty? Where's number forty? There you are. 
And I'd also like number 121. So close. Where's 121? In the way back. Beautiful. All right, we got a couple of new things to add to this. We still have a cassette. Are you eyeing that cassette? Because I've got a laser disc here for a film called Boxing Helena that Jennifer Lynch directed. The daughter. All right, you're going for the cassette. You come on up. You want this VHS tape of Fire Walk with me? That is for you. All right, where's number um, 20? Where's number 49? Beautiful. This is not a laser disc of Peyton Place. This is a soundtrack for Douglas Sirk's Imitation of Life. Here's Boxing Helena. And here are two CDs. One, the Twin Peaks soundtrack, and one, David Lynch's The Straight Story. Imitation of Life, very good. What would you like, sir? The CD, that's good. All right, where's number 99? 99? Beautiful. And number 88. Where's number 88? Okay, how about 89? How about 80? Oh, uh, there we go. You got it. Oh, you know what you're getting. When you see the trailer for this before the movie, you are going to be a happy person. Give it up for all of our winners here. All right, so as we walk into Blue Velvet, those of you that know Twin Peaks, this is, this is Twin Peaks, only more so. And this is the movie version, and it is a remake of Peyton Place. Now, Midnight's for Maniacs, we've got a couple of more events coming up. At the end of the month here, May 27th, May 27th is the fifth element, 20th anniversary, with a movie called Run, Lola, Run. In June, June 24th, we've got a double bill of Lost in Translation with Marie Antoinette. And in July, July 27th, the 20th anniversary of Beavis and Butthead Do America. And I'm serious about that movie. It's brilliant. It plays with Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Now, every single decade, you run into people misunderstanding or dismissing cinema. Blue Velvet, this is a film that is truly going to knock your socks off, especially if you haven't seen it before. So I'd love for you to raise your hand if you've never seen this movie before. Give them a hand right now. Because they have no clue how they will be altered after this. Now I have one trivia question. From Peyton Place and to Blue Velvet, what actor is in both movies? Hope Lang! Hope Lang! You raised your hand and you knew it in the back. So you're coming down here and you're coming down here. Come on down. We're gonna have a break dance off. Now for getting this correct, what I'm giving you is the entire collection, full set of Twin Peaks cards. That goes to you. Thank you. You're welcome for knowing Hope Lang. Now you, this is donated from Spoke Art Museum. It is an actual Twin Peaks alternative poster, limited edition of a hundred. You do. 
Please give it up to Rick. And I mean this, Rick is one of many of you in this room who you support local theaters, you come out to movies because it changes your life, it gives you something to look forward to, and you give the respect to these theaters and these movies that I have felt my whole life, and it means so much to me that you're here. My name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix, this is Midnight's for Maniacs.